Oh, and let me ask that at the end, let's hold all the questions till, till then. I have a little bit of a cold, so um, if I cough, I apologize. So I'll try not to. Now, how many people are currently using Internet Archive? Oh, just a few. Okay. All right, good. All right, are you ready? Yep. Okay. So let's get started. So this is what the website looks like, in case you've never seen it before. And if you've heard me speak before, you know I'm a big fan of digitized book websites. And that's because digitized book websites give us, I think, some of the best genealogical gems you can find. Because it's almost like going to a library, but you're at your house. And you can just peruse all day long. Now, Internet Archive does a lot of things, though. It's not just digitized books, like when we talk about Google Books or a half to trust. It is microfilms, it's audio recordings, it's images, and it's the Wayback Machine. Now, in case you don't know, it's at HTTPS uh, archive.org. That's the URL, and I gave you that in the handout. They say that they are building a digital library of internet sites and other cultural artifacts in digital form. Like a paper library, they provide free access to researchers, historians, scholars, the print disabled, and the general public. So really, they're just building this huge library. And just like a library, there's all kinds of things. So what do they have? Well, through their efforts to kind of archive the internet, they have over 279 billion web pages. And I'm going to show you how you'll want to use this. They have 11 million books and texts, and I'm going to show you how they even have a genealogy collection. They have 4 million audio recordings, including live concerts. If you're a Deadhead fan, a Grateful Dead fan, they have Grateful Dead concerts. They have 1 million images, and then they also have 100,000 software programs. Now, obviously, we can't talk about all of that. What I've done is I've picked out a few things, and I've also given you links to some of the collections that I think you would really want to explore. Now, how do they do this? Well, they scan things themselves, so that's one way that they do it. But they also connect with institutional partners. In fact, one of their partners is Allen County Public Library. And as you know, that's one of the largest genealogy collections in the United States. The nice thing about that is, for some of us, we don't have the time, money, or, or the inclination to go to Fort Wayne, Indiana. But this way, you can use Fort Wayne, Indiana's collections right online, including their microfilm collection. I should also say there's also individuals who have also digitized and uh, uploaded their information. So here's an example. This is the genealogy collection. And right now, as of the other day, they had 136,000 items. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. So it, it's just such a wonderful resource for us genealogists that we should be using. I will tell you that my personal opinion is sometimes it's a little difficult to search but hopefully we'll get over some of that. And the nice thing is you can share things, you can favorite, you can do all kinds of stuff. Now, you don't have to have an account, but I'll show you at the end one of the reasons to have a free library card to this resource is you can even borrow books that are not in the public domain, like a library. So here's the genealogy collection it tells you. It's an ever-expanding collection of genealogy resources from Allen County, uh, Roberts, uh, Roberts Library, University of Toronto. I think there's a BYU Family History Library in here. Now the thing is, this is constantly changing. So it's not a resource that you can just try once and then, okay, I'm done. You have to constantly be going back. And one of the things I tell people to do is it's always good to keep a research log. You might want to keep a research log for your internet searches and just say, okay, this, this day I searched this part, this is what I searched, these surnames or this place, so that when you go back to it and they have 200,000 items, you know you need to redo that search. Now, it's fabulous. And it's fabulous because it has all kinds of different partners. So I'll tell you, 
One of my projects that I did was researching a British spinster named Martha Proby. She had a, what we call a commonplace book. It's a book that she had copied information from another set of books on mineralogy. The Gemological Institute of America, if you have diamonds, they're the ones who tell jewelers how to grade those diamonds. They have a library in Carlsbad, California. And those two books that I researched, they're actually manuscripts, uh, are kept in a rare book room. You have to sit there and research them and have somebody stare at you to make sure that you're not doing anything you shouldn't do. Well, they put them offline on the Internet Archive. Now, anybody can look at them. They don't have to travel. They don't have to have anybody staring at them. They can take their time. That's the benefit of this. So not only are you going to want to search to find books that might be of interest to you, but you might want to search to see what libraries have contributed here that could be of use to you as well. And that's, that's what the manuscript looks like. <clears throat> Now the nice thing is, is a lot of these libraries who contributed to Internet Archive, when you go to their card catalog, so this is the one for Martha's uh, book, it says on there, it's online, it gives you the URL. And I found that that's true of other libraries as well. It'll say uh, digital version is here and it'll take you straight to Internet Archive. Okay. Now before we get much further, I just want to give you this as kind of background. Because I think it's important when we say libraries that we define them. Because sometimes we forget all the different types of libraries. <clears throat> so, Internet Archive works with all kinds of libraries. I showed you the Gemological Institute of America. That's kind of a, a private library, even though they are open to the public. But we know, right now, we're in a public library, right? And we usually go to find things for our uh, genealogy that include maybe history books, uh, maybe they have a local history section, that kind of thing. There's also private libraries. And having them digitize their collections and put them on the Internet Archive is helpful because then you don't have to worry about any restrictions. There's academic libraries, and they are also represented here on Internet Archive. In fact, Brigham Young University in Utah has a family history library. I'll tell you that if you ever go to Salt Lake and research at the family history library, and you're there on Sunday, you know the big thing is, oh, we're going to do it Sunday, right? There's nothing to do. Well, BYU Family History Library is open, so you can go there. But they have stuff here on the Internet Archive. There's state libraries, and you guys know the State Library for California is here in Sacramento. Some state libraries are on Internet Archive. We have some national libraries, and I think they do have some stuff from uh, Library of Congress, and then genealogy libraries. The big one on Internet Archive is the Allen County Public Library. So those are the kind of libraries that we should be seeking out as we look for our genealogy. Now, what can you find on Internet Archive? It's really hard for me to say because it's everything. And I'm constantly surprised at what there is. So there's city directories. And they're in all kinds of different places. So there's not one city directory collection. Some of them are in the genealogy collection. Some of them are in what uh, is called additional collections. There's family histories. There's local histories, and also there's materials that are from our public to domain materials. So we're talking about you know, histories from the 1800s. The census is on the Internet Archive. And you may think, well, how's that? Well, they have a microfilm collection. And so you can look at National Archives microfilm on Internet Archive. Now, why would you want to do that, right? I mean, we can use Ancestry, we can use Family Search. You know, looking uh, uh, image by image can be important, especially if it's mistranscribed or misindexed. There's yearbooks. In fact, lots of places have uploaded their yearbooks, so it's quite a collection of yearbooks there. Periodicals. Uh, for example, uh, the Mormon Church has the Relief Society. It was a women's magazine. Uh, it stopped about the 1970s. That's on the Internet Archive. Period pieces, especially films from earlier generations. There's even TV shows. So all kinds of things. 
the microfilm ephemera. So ephemera are things that were meant to be kind of thrown away. So like little uh, pamphlets, for example, uh, those can be found on Internet Archive. And then there's also movies. Whether they're movies that the government uh, produced and made available, or people are being encouraged to put their own movies up. I'm not sure if we all want to watch that, but you know, it's your family history. All right. Before we get into all that, let's talk about the Wayback Machine, because I think that this is a tool that is imperative for you to know about. <laughs> Especially since we consider some of the things that have been happening in genealogy recently, right? Roots Web was down for, what, a year? And it still isn't all there. And so that's one way you can find some Roots Web pages. There's another genealogy website that's down right now that I'll show you. Now, this is the thing. They're trying to archive different websites, but it's not the entire website. And obviously, if it's a website behind a subscription wall, it's not going to be that. And sometimes it's only one page. Okay, so there are limitations. So when we go to Internet Archive, it's at the top, and it says the Wayback Machine. Now, it says you can enter the URL or you can enter a keyword. Let's just assume you know the URL. Maybe this is an old source you saw or uh, an old family history somebody had. You can copy and paste the URL into that search engine and it will see if it has a cached version of that website. If it took a photo of it. Now if you just click on Wayback Machine, this page will come up and I'm going to show you something about this page as well. So it says it has 333 billion web pages. Now this started about 1996, so nothing is going to be older than that, right? And like I said, not everything has been archived. So I put in a website that I think you should know about. It's called evidenceexplained.com. And this is a website, uh, Elizabeth Shaw Mills, who's uh, one, you know, she's a very famous genealogist, she has. It has wonderful lessons on genealogy, but right now, they're doing some maintenance to it in a scam. So I wanted to check it out, so I went ahead and put it in the box, the URL, and this is what I got. So what happens is, it shows me that it started archiving it basically in 2012. And every once in a while, it went back and took a picture of it. Now, what does this mean for you? Well, websites change over time. So maybe what I want isn't in the newest cache of the website. Maybe it is back to 2012. I can go and I can click on all those different dates and look at different versions of the web page. So I can do that up there in that timeline. I can also do it with this calendar where it shows me exactly when they took the picture of the website. So I clicked on one of them and here it is, there's the website and up there it shows me what date this was done. This was done <coughs> on May 10th, 2017 I think. And so that's what it looked like on that day. So this has a lot of use for us as genealogists, especially as things go away or they, they have problems like in the case of Roots Web, so that we can see what we need. Now that's great, and I've used this quite often when I can't find a website to see where it is. But there's something else I wanted you to be aware of, because I think this is the best. Right where the arrow is and it says save page now, you can go to a website, let's say it's your website. You can put the URL in that box and it will save a copy of that page. So this is what I did. Did you, did you guys ever use the Ancestry Wiki? Okay, so Ancestry has a wiki and for about three months it was down. They got rid of it. And when I kept asking why should I said it's valuable, and I'll tell you why you should be using it. The Ancestry Wiki has the source and the Red Book. Now, the Red Book is an old Ancestry publication that gives you every state in the United States 
and it has a uh, table that shows you the name of the county, where the county records are, and it gives you the dates that birth, marriage, death, land, probate, and court records started. That's what you need so that you know when records started. Well, they have its own URL. They decided that nobody's using that, maybe except Gina, and so they got rid of it. So then I start complaining a lot. Hey, what's going on? Well, they decide to put it on RootsWeb. So now, if you go to RootsWeb, on the front page, it tells you what they're, what's happening with the website, and one of the things says, here's the Ancestry Wiki. So I clicked on Ancestry Wiki, I clicked on the state of Arizona, and it had the big table of when records started. I put the URL in there, and I saved it. That way, if this happens again, uh, Internet Archive will have a picture of that page that I looked at. So you can be part of saving the Internet, basically, and saving these caches of the Internet, which I think is fabulous. So that's one way that you can use Internet Archive. That's part of their mission. They're saving things. So that's the internet part. Oh, and this is the page that I saved. And so this is what the Ancestry Wiki has. You can see it's the county, the address, when it was formed, and what county it was formed out of. And then it has all the dates when those record sets started. This is a really valuable service. And I'll tell you, use it so that Ancestry keeps it up. All right. Let's talk about my next favorite part of this, and that is the text collection, okay? This is probably where you're gonna spend the majority of your time. Now, we're gonna kind of go and talk about browsing, searching, searching within the book, searching from, I told you a little bit about library catalogs, and I should also mention that a lot of these you can find if you're searching on Google. So if you're conducting a Google search, if the book is on Internet Archive, it should come up in that Google search. So that's another way that you may come across something in the Internet Archive. So when we're on the main page of Internet Archive, I have an arrow going to this orange open book. That's the text collection. Now, you could search from the home page. I wouldn't do that if I were you. You can try, but if you're using a search term that's very broad, you're, you're probably going to get a lot of hits from all over the place. I would try to kind of get down to the books or the genealogy collection or the American Libraries collection. I wouldn't do a homepage search unless you just want to see what else is out there. So when I click on text, this is what I see. These are the e-books and text. Now, I told you most of this is going to be public domain, so you can actually download it if you want. And Internet Archive allows you to download it in all kinds of different formats, including e-reader formats. If it's a newer book, because there are newer books on here, you can borrow it. And that's where the library card is important. Now, as you can see, we're in that collection, and it has kind of a Pinterest look. Right? It's, it's got these little squares with images. That's one way you can look at this. Uh, you can also look at it as a list. And, and that might be useful, especially if you're trying to look at something alphabetical. But if we're on this page, what you're going to want to do is either, to start with, look at American Libraries, or do you see the third one in is Additional Collections. You can click on additional collections, and that's where the genealogy collection is. Now, I put an arrow there so you can see how you can sort this so it doesn't look like this. It does uh, go by titles, for example. Or The problem with the titles is sometimes if the title is A or the, it will alphabetize it by that, and that might not be very helpful. Uh, and you can sort it by date published. You can also sort it by creator. Now, the other thing that Internet Archive and really all the digitized book websites have is this on the left-hand side. 
that allows you to narrow your focus way down. So let's say you're researching a very broad topic like California. You might want to narrow it down by the type of collection, by the year. You can do that there on the left-hand side, just like you can on other digitized book websites. So here's American libraries. And these are all the American libraries that are participating in Internet Archive. Now, in some cases, <coughs> like uh, Allen County Public Library, they may be found in various sections. American libraries, in the genealogy collection, plus they have their own page. So sometimes you can happen upon information that's saved in, in various collections. Okay, so that's possible. So you can go through here and you can choose which library you want to look at. Now sometimes this is a good idea, all right? So for example, there at the top, there's the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. If you are researching North Carolina, you might want to just search there. That's okay. But you know, we don't always know what we want or where it's located, right? So that's not always the best way to search. Now, you can also use this search engine here on the left-hand side to search in those collections as well. Now, if I reorder it so it doesn't have that Pinterest look, and I do the, uh, I can do views, I can do titles, this is what it looks like. I don't know if that helps you more. If it does, then use it. It's just another example of how you can do it. I think what probably is difficult for people is when you're in that kind of Pinterest look with the, the images, you have to keep scrolling and scrolling. And if they have added anything, it, you may say, okay, additional collections is always at the top. Well, then you might go back and it's not at the top anymore. Uh, I know that happens with genealogy. It keeps moving around the page, and so it makes it difficult to find. Now, once you choose uh, what you're going to look at, or you choose the topic, so I just did a general genealogy. Now, this isn't the genealogy collection, this is every book they have, supposedly, that has the word genealogy. Okay? There's actually more than this, but this is what I got. Now, you can see <coughs> that here at the first, it has the picture of the book, and then there's a little renew button or borrow button. That's the books that you can borrow. So that you would be able to look at it for a limited time period, and then it would be give it back, basically. So that's not something that you would have access to whenever you want. And then the third book in, Bloss Genealogy, that's, that you can just download for free. It doesn't have that borrow button. Now, if 104,000 books is a little too much for you to look through, which I understand, obviously you could do a better search than just saying genealogy. That's not very helpful. But you could also go to that left-hand side and you can narrow the search. So for example, they have 30 movies. So that might be kind of interesting to check out what that is. But they also have four collections. So you might want to look through that. Or uh, you can look through 104,000 texts. And then it asks, uh, what about availability? You can say, I want stuff that's always available. So that's free or stuff to borrow, or there's even a wait list on some of those items. So you can find something you want to borrow and you can be on the wait list. Now if we scroll down, there's even more choices according to collection, the creator, the language. Because this is kind of worldwide and they have all kinds of different items, you know, you might want to say, okay, I just want English. Or if you're doing German genealogy, then click German. All right, so we're back to American libraries. And those libraries are all kinds of wonderful libraries. So I told you Brigham Young University has the Family History Library. There's the Minnesota Historical Society. There's the State Library of North Carolina. So there's all kinds of libraries here that you can check out. 
So here's BYU's Family History Library. Now they don't have a lot of results, they have 809, so not a lot, but in here you can find some county history books, you can find some surname books, a little bit of everything. You can see these top books are cemetery uh, transcription books. Now when I click on a book that I want to look at, this is what the interface looks like, all right? So it literally looks like an open book on a black background. Now, what I don't want to do is, do you see how there's a search engine right there at the top right? Don't use that, all right? All right, what I want to do instead is, and I'm going to move, I know I'm not supposed to move, but I'm moving. <laughs> right here, there's a magnifying glass, and there's arrows to expand. You expand that page, so it, you're, all, all you're seeing is that book, and then you can search within that book. So let's say you get a county history for the county your ancestor lived in. Open up the book and then just search inside that book for the name that you're looking at. Now, what happens is, is you'll see all these, it'll, it'll take a little bit for it to search, and then they'll have all these kind of thumbtack looking things. And you have to go through each one and see if that's really the term you want. I found that sometimes the search isn't the best, so you just really have to look really closely. The other thing is, once you expand that view, it's easier to page through the document or the book as well. So that's important. Now, the home page for each of the books has the book, but then it has the information underneath, which includes card catalog information. Right, title, author, a little bit about what it, what's about. If you care, if you are into popular genealogy books, it even tells you how many views. So this uh, Virginia Parish Register has had 16,000 views. Now, here's the other thing you can do. Let's say that you have a blog or a website for your family history. And this is a book that has all your family in it. Well, you, and you want to share that with everybody. You can, there's a little button underneath that looks like a, kind of like an arrow coming out. You can share either this book, the whole book, or just a page on your website or blog. It will give you the uh, HTML code. You copy and you paste that into your blog, and then that book is embedded on your website or blog. So that's another thing you can now, if we scroll down the page, it tells us if there's any reviews. Usually, genealogy books don't have reviews. I don't think you need that. But uh, it tells you all the ways you can download it. And so it's, it gives you PDF. It gives you Kindle. It gives you all kinds of ways that you can download this. And then it tells you all the different collections on the Internet Archive that has this item. So it's in the Family History Library, it's in the American Libraries, it's in Genealogy, so it's in all of those. That goes back to what I was saying about you might find libraries in different sections of the Internet Archive or even uh, their items. <coughs> and then if I go to BYU Libraries website, I can find a book and then they'll say copies are accessible online. So you should be happy when you do library catalog searches, you should be looking for that, for links uh, to where you can find it online as well as searching the Internet Archive. All right? Now I want to, since I did pull up the Internet, let's, let's try to do this line and see what happens. I'm brave. I'm brave. We'll see, we'll see what happens. All right, so here it is. Let's do that. Why am I saying right there? Okay, let's go to additional collections. All right, and we have to, this is the brave part, trying to find the genealogy collection. There we go. All right, so let's do genealogy. Nothing will happen. All right, so there's genealogy. And we'll 
we'll just do this just to make it easier. Okay. So there it is. And there's the book. And so just like anything else, it's going to have arrows that you can push and you can go page by page. You can also, not in obviously this view that it's showing now, usually you can also click on a page and it'll move. You can also use this to go forward. All right. And then you can read it. You can, like I said, there's a search engine that you can search.
Now this is a little harder to check out because we go from looking at books that have their cover page or title page and seeing exactly what it is to looking at this, which makes, you know, some of it's black, some of it just says National Archives, it doesn't give you a whole heck of what's there. You have to look underneath the image to see what it is. So that top one says, <coughs> Real 8, 1893, City Directories of the United States. Now we can tell the image does say Atlanta, <coughs> Georgia. So you can go through there and you can look through that city directory for Atlanta. Now here's the other kind of bad part in this view. There's real eight. If you go three down, there's real seven. So it's kind of all over the place, right? That's where you might want to do that list view where it's alphabetical. That might help you a little bit more um, because it, it's just all over. And I know as I kind of scroll down, I wanted to see all the different microfilm. Things were just all over the place. Now, City directories, you can see these on Ancestry. But the reason you want access to, it's not really the original, but it's kind of the original, it's an original copy, is this. When you go on Ancestry, and they digitize things like city directories. In fact, if you go to LA Public Library, they'll say, hey, why are you here looking at the city directories? We gave them to Ancestry, they're all online. Well, at least in one case that I know of, Ancestry only digitized up to the letter L on one of the city directories. <laughs> you wouldn't know that unless you were paying really close attention. That's why you want copies of stuff like that, because what if your people's name is M, right? You're not going to find it there. You want to look at where you can find the actual microfilm. Now, what do they have here? City directories. They have newspapers. They have, in fact, they have the New York Times and other newspapers. There are books on microfilm. Set the U.S. Census. That may or may not be as useful to you because, quite frankly, when you're on Ancestry, for example, you can go page by page in the microfilm copies. But sometimes you can find that some people the copies a little cleaner or a little better to use. Passenger lists. Compiled service records of the Revolutionary War. Western Pennsylvania naturalization records, 1820 to 1931. The Freedmen Bureau records. Now, some of these are on Family Search and Ancestry, and I don't know what the duplication is. Military bounty land records. Compiled records from Confederate organizations, so Civil War, and Index of Patents. There's a lot there. And that was just me kind of scrolling through and saying, oh, okay, you know, would this be of interest to me? So it's really one of those sources that's nice to have because you never know when you need a copy of that. Now, like I said, it's a lot easier to look at, but sometimes it does take some finagling to go through the microfilm. Now, here's the problem. You have to kind of look this way, right? Uh, but the good thing is you can make it bigger so you can see it better. And this is the Indian census rolls. I know I forgot to say that. Those are on Ancestry. But as you can see, they're really awful because uh, it bled through. And that's another reason that when you search on Ancestry, you might not be able to find what you need because the OCR can't pick that up. So that might be a reason to look at this. Now, when I scroll down on that Indian census roll, this is what it, it looks like. And it gives me some information about what's on that roll, and it tells me exactly that it's real to and what Native Americans are included and what dates. It gives me the original call number, and then on the right, it gives me the opportunity to download that if I want to. And then finally, it tells me what collections has that microfilm. So let's go and let me show you that. I can find it. Let's do city directors. 
since those are usually a little nicer to change, change the cartridge on this. They're a little cleaner. I also always like to see this information at the beginning to kind of see what there is. And uh, this, actually, this is why you should always look at the introductory material because it says it's lacking pages 11 and 12 and 1335 to 1370. So some of the information is not there. Now I can search this, I can browse it, I can do whatever I want with it. But um, that can be really useful, especially if you go to Ancestry and look and see if they have this this original is from the New York Historic and Genealogy Society, I believe. And so you can kind of see, did Ancestry uh, film this? What did they film? That kind of thing. All right. So those are city directories. And as you know, city directories should also be used anytime you're using censuses. They fill in the gaps between the 10 years. Now, they do have newspapers as well, and they're kind of very to oh, yeah, It's a private library, and you have to have a PhD or be recommended by a PhD to research there. And a lot of people who do, for example, Western research, research there, they actually have uh, early LA County court records that were given to them. My understanding is, I won't swear to this, but, um, I believe family search is digitizing those. Because I told somebody about that. And they said, well, should we digitize stuff? I said, you need to go to Huntington and get those LA County. <laughs> well, uh, uh, El Dorado County, uh, um, mm -hmm. the courthouse burned. And they have a lot of El Dorado County. Records. Oh, do they? Yeah. OK. And yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. and see, you know, this was a year or so ago. So, you know, hopefully, who knows how long that will take. So there's 
there's 572 results, but see, these are mostly, yeah. you know, besides the Masons, there's also kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, blaming the Masons, uh, yeah, so there's, there's some, yeah. Now, I mean, here's one history of a lodge that, you know, if that was the lodge he was in, that would be good. So, you know, if you think about stuff that maybe a library has that they have uh, digitized, that's a possibility. So you might want to look and see if you know what lodge he was in, or you could, you know, do a search. You can do advanced searches on Internet Archive. So you could do Masons and then whatever lodge or what state or whatever. So you could try that. Yeah. I mean, there's the Masons in Michigan. It's one of those things it's hard to say yes or no to because people have all these kind of just crazy collections that they add here, and so there can be really interesting things. Yes. Did you have a question? Oh, yes. Is it possible to download an image? As long as it's not one of the to borrow. Okay. Uh, but yes, and the way you can do it is you can either download the whole thing, you know, as a PDF or whatever, or uh, when you use the share button, which kind of looks like a box with an arrow, uh, you can download just that image or that page, or like I said, you can embed it. So yeah, you can definitely do that. And then obviously if, if you can't figure that out, you can also do a screenshot. Yeah. Uh, the newspapers that are on here, yes. does it link to LLC or is this a standalone collection? It's a standalone or collection. I don't think for the newspapers.com. Well, newspapers.com has way, you know, m many more. I think newspapers.com is meant kind of for genealogists, so it's a little easier to search. So that's that's probably. But you know. are, there, are there papers on uh, archive? Oh, I'm sure there is. Yeah. Because, and the reason why, I mean, I haven't done a comparison, but I'm sure there is, is because uh, they're either getting them stuff that has been given to them, Internet Archive, or libraries who are putting them up. And so that's how they're getting them. So I'm sure there is stuff that's different. I know there's some foreign language newspapers as well that I've seen. So. Uh, I was going to say, we could try looking at the newspaper collection. So if you just search on newspapers, they have different things. Let's just do this. Well, does, does it go to CDS, for example? This is what it does. Fairly simple. You can browse my subject. 
title pages are the covers of these books. So here's one, the genealogical notes are contributions to family history of some of the first settlers of Connecticut and Massachusetts. So it gives you, it doesn't give you a description, it gives you what the front page looks like. And if you uh, scroll down, it tells you that there's three editions. And that first one from 1856, it says read online, that takes you to Internet Archive. So you could use Open Library as one way to search for what you need, and then it will take you to Internet Archive as well. That's a thought that you could try uh, as well. And what I like about it is it also gives you some ideas from other books that might be of interest. Now, if you have access to a digitized book website, what do you need a library card for? Well, because the majority of private work interested in is going to be public domain stuff, you don't. You can just search and don't worry about a sign-in or a library card or any of that. But if you do come across a newer book that you can only look at if you borrow it, then you need a library card. And that's free. You just click on get a virtual library card and you give them your email address, you come up with a screen name and a password and then you click get a library card. Now just like at a regular library, that's going to be time limited, I think it's two weeks and then that's it. But you may come across situations where they do have a book that you want to borrow and you want to do that. Alright. What questions do you have for me about the books or the materials on the Internet Archive? Um, is Open Library, I think that, yeah, Open Library a part of the archive or is it a separate URL? It's a separate URL. So you just Google Open Library. I should have mentioned this too before I answer your question. Uh, and I put this in your handout. One of the great collections I think on Internet Archive is JSTOR. Now let me explain what that is. And when we looked at the Italian newspapers, that's the first thing that came up. JSTOR, J-S-T-O-R, is a periodical index. And you can go to that website. You just go to JSTOR and you can go to it. Now, JSTOR used to be only available if you were at either a large library with a subscription, an academic library with a subscription, that kind of thing. But they realized that people like genealogists want the information on JSTOR. So you can do a search on JSTOR from home, and you can even have what's called My JSTOR, where you can have a free account, and you can save three items at a time on a bookshelf. Now, some of the items, you can't look at the entire article. They want you either to pay for it, or you can do interlibrary loan. And typically what I do is I wait until I go to an academic library or a bigger library, uh, including the Family History Library in Salt Lake, and then I just see what I need and download it right there for free. Now what they've done is some of their older articles that should be public domain, they've put on Internet Archive. So what that means for you is articles on topics that have to do with the time period your ancestor lived in or the events they were a part of, things that academics would have written about. So things I find on there are, are everything from circus slang, you know, surface folk have their own vocabulary, right? To um, census data and it being analyzed to what were women doing in 1800 work-wise. So that's why when we look at a source like Internet Archive, we've got to search beyond just a name. Okay? In genealogy, we're used to going on ancestry and searching by name, date, place. But when we do a digitized book website or periodicals, we want to extend that search out. So we want to search by a place or an event or occupation or masons 
you know, what were they involved in? Because then we're going to get great material that was written at the time of the event by people involved. So for example, this is the year that we, it's the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. So let's say that you want to know what was my family doing during World War I in Sacramento County. You could look for some kind of history on World War I in Sacramento. And there are county history books where they talked about what were the women doing during World War I in their county. And there's pictures of the Red Cross, and they talked about what the different church groups did. That would give you a sense of what was my ancestor involved in. That's the kind of things you use a digitized book website for, not just searching on your ancestor's name. Yeah, sir. Well, the question I have, if you're using like open library, yes. and it's a book that you need to borrow, and you're at your two weeks, are you able to take screenshots from that? I would think you could. Now, whether you're supposed to is a different story. Well, I mean, that's yeah. the, the mm -hmm. uh, copyright. Yeah. Probably the other thing you might want to consider is going to WorldCat. Now, Open Library is going to hopefully tell you where it is, though I found sometimes Open Library doesn't know everyone who has uh, a copy of that book. I would go to WorldCat and then uh, do a search on that book and see who else has a copy of it, because maybe you could also do interlibrary loan. Yeah. So that's the other thing, because I notice on uh, Open Library, it's not perfect. And so it doesn't always give you everything. What was the resource you guys mentioned? The world Cat? World Cat. So World, W-O-R-L-D. Here, I'll even show it to you. And then Cat. Let's see. Dot org. Now, what that is, is that's a library catalog for the world. But not every library participates in it. And so you can do a search. Uh, let's see. Let's do this. You can do a topic search, you can do a title search. I don't know this person. Okay. So it's a library catalog. And so the beauty of it is this. If you scroll down, you can enter your location and it will find libraries that have that item near you. Now I put in my zip code where I live, right? And so it says Orange County Public Libraries has it. So that's the beauty of WorldCat. So if you do find something on Open Library and, and it just doesn't seem like it has what you need, you could go to WorldCat and look for it there. Now the other benefit of WorldCat is Family Search also participates in it. So you could search on something and it will say that it's at fa the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. Yes? You mentioned yearbooks. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if this would be a good site to donate yearbooks. You know, that's a good question. Yeah, you know, Internet Archive is in the Bay Area. So you definitely could ask them if they would be interested in giving in those yearbooks to digitize. I imagine that is how they get some of the materials. Well, some of the heritage societies that have belonged to, I'm thinking of one in particular, a lady has 40 years of stuff under her, in Berkeley, under yeah. her house, and she wants to do something with it. And the organization doesn't, you know, but it's valuable. It is valuable, definitely. You know, that's something you could ask Internet Archive. You could also ask Ancestry. Um, those are two places that you could ask if they wanted to digitize it. Obviously, if she felt like she wanted to do it, she could digitize it. That seems like a lot of work, though, yes. Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you. When you're saying borrow a book for two weeks, is that the physical book? No, it's a digital copy. A digital copy. And then also you said you get two weeks and that's it. Yeah. Does that mean you can never borrow that book? No, you can borrow it again. Yeah. Unless there's a wait list. Oh, right, right. You, yeah, and then you can ask to, you know, then you uh, click on the wait list and you're put on the wait list. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can do that. 
Yes. Uh, internet being international, uh, does the archive extend very far into Canada or Europe or whatever? Yes, so they do have, in fact, let's go back there. When you go to text, and then you wait, <laughs> there's Canadian libraries right there. Now, um, I have seen things in other, you know, uh, I've seen a lot of Arabic things and stuff. There's not that I know of a collection of European, oh, there it is, there it is, European libraries, there it is. Yeah, and, and obviously that's going to change over time too. So you can click on there and see what libraries we're talking about. You know, National Library of Scotland, if you're doing Scottish research, you want that. Now you can see there's not a lot there though, it's only 4,000. But once again, that's going to be, you know, added to as they get more money. You know, this is all about money. Right? The library I told you about, I did research at the Gemological Institute of America. They got this huge setup with the camera and the tent that goes over and the whole thing. That's, that's tens of thousands of dollars. And so some of these places, they do it as they get money to digitize. Yes. So I have a lot of Christian science women in my oh, background. Yeah. And the Internet Archive bought a former Christian science church. They do, that's right. Yes, it is. But I can't find any records about Christmas. Did they not teach them? Or? You know, uh, that's interesting. I, I don't know if those records were there when they bought them. You know, they may have donated them to another archive. Well, did the Christian Science keep records? I don't know. Do they have I don't know. I don't know. So what I would do is I'd look at Family Search. And I would do a keyword search for Christian Science and see what's there. I'm not sure what our records Christian Scientists keep. Okay. Maybe they left them in the building. They might have. And so you might want to, yeah, you should ask. They have a contact us on the website. You should ask that. That's interesting. So you should go there and do a tour. Right? <laughs> do they have tours? I think they do, yeah. yeah. And actually, if you go to YouTube, there is a tour of the building. Maybe on the ball. Yeah. Now, someone mentioned Mason. Mm -hmm. Other than finding where your ancestor was at a certain location, what records would the Masons have? There's not a lot, but uh, the, Mason, the Masonic records that I've seen, uh, I got some on one of my ancestors that basically was the men who put him forward to membership. So it had their names, it had his signature. So there wasn't a lot there, but there was something. And obviously, you know, if you're lucky enough to have home sources, you might get, you know, different uh, items that he had as a Mason. But a lot of times, it, it may not be a lot of information. I have both been to minutes and meetings and okay. procedures and that sort of thing. Yeah, and so where you would find something like that, which he's talking about, like these books that have membership lists and minutes of meetings and stuff are usually archives, and maybe not the Masons. So that's where you want to use a website called Archive Grid. And then you could do a search on, you know, either what lodge or we'll just, let's just do California Masons. So that brought up 649 results. And so you can see there's everything from uh, clippings, there's a ledger, and that would have names of members, records of dues, that kind of thing. So, yeah. So that's always an archival, if, if the Masons don't have it, it's an archival record that someone has. You can see right here, this is at UC Davis. Archival collections sometimes end up in weird places. That's why it's good to look at archive for it. Now, you could also do that search in Internet Archive, or yeah, Internet Archive, to see if there is, like what we looked at before, any kind of pamphlets or any kind of books 
that might correspond with that group. Yes. Oh, would there be on this um, internet archive of um, would churches um, this the old records that they might have had? The only way you would see church records, like that parish register I showed, is if somebody, most likely if somebody had published it as a book. So I have had people say, oh, I found parish registers on Internet Archive, but that's because they were published as a book. Now that's not to say that maybe someone did have a list that they uploaded, but for the most part you're talking about books. Where is the best place to find pictures of your ancestor? Not on Internet Archive, probably, even though they have images. So uh, there's a few places. That's kind of a big topic. So if we're talking about photos of our ancestor, obviously ancestor is one place, uh, because people upload those kinds of photos to their trees, right? And that's how ancestry gets stuff. There's also websites that specialize in reuniting people and the two that I can think of off the top of my head is Dead Fred and uh, Ancient Faces. Ancient Faces. So that's another website where people, you know, they buy a photo album or whatever, they digitize it and they make, in fact that's how I found uh, some photos for a client. Now the other thing you can do is you could just do a Google search and see if you find something like on someone's website. But that's kind of where you would look. The, I guess the other place you could look is newspapers. Like if you go to a site like newspapers.com or Genealogy Bank, sometimes obviously people get their photo in the newspaper. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, no. Well, JSTOR has different uh, subscriptions. And so what you would see at one library versus, let's say, the Family History Library matters what their subscription is. Now, I don't know if there's a difference between at home and institution. I'm not positive. But yeah, that is one way you can get into JSTORs through a big library like San Francisco. And um, that really is the benefit of going and getting as many library cards as possible. Is San Francisco, for example, has some great databases you can access from home. Yeah. Does uh, archives.com or org um, link to uh, Center for Sacramento History? I don't think so. I won't swear to that, but I don't think so. They could if they wanted to. Yes. At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned maybe it was the internet market. Uh, going back to find like an expired website page. Oh, way back machine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you do with that? Like, what's the benefit to you when you do that? What are you looking for? Well, the benefit is you need information on that website page, and it's gone. I mean, that's really the benefit of it. So, uh, I mean, let's use RootsWeb as an example. Let's say you have a cousin that had a RootsWeb uh, family website, and now it's gone. And you know that that website had a picture of your grandparents, and you didn't save it. So the benefit is, you know, you could go, and if they saved that web page, you can now download the picture of your grandparents. Oh, okay. So you know, sometimes what happens is, and we're all guilty of this, right? We find information, we're really excited and everything, and, and maybe we don't save everything we should have, or, you know, oh, it's going to be there next time, I don't need to worry about it. Yeah. So it's the ability to go back and check that out. So, and it's not always going to be something you need. It's going to be like when RootsWeb went down, mm -hmm. or they took away the Ancestry Wiki, or you know that kind of thing. Or you can't find the thing you thought was saved somewhere. That you <laughs> find it there. Yeah. But they don't save every page on the website. So right. like Ancestry Wiki, for example, the Red Book. Gosh, that's that's an actual book that has probably 300 pages. 
Wayback Machine didn't take a picture of each page. They only took a picture of a few of them. So that, that can help you, but it may not because it didn't take the, you know, the uh -huh. picture of every page. Okay. I don't really understand what a wiki is. What is wiki? What's a wiki? Yeah. Oh, I can show you that. Okay, in fact, let me show you right now. Oh, let's hope I can smell, spell correctly here. It's so good this is being recorded so people can say, look, Gina can't spell. <laughs> okay, so here's Roots Web. And so this is what it looks like today. And you click on there. Now a wiki, the benefit of a wiki is it, it's not a static website. <laughs> something where anybody, now on the Ancestry wiki, the they have two things. The source, which used to be for those of us who've been doing genealogy forever, that was the Bible of genealogy. That's where you would learn about how to do genealogy. Here's the red book. Now, the wiki doesn't digitize the book. It just has pages about it, so we'll do Arizona. So here's Arizona, and over there on the right is all the different parts of that chapter. So history, about the bio records, the census records, that tells you what population schedules were part of, uh, you know, there's the mortality schedule. So it, usually a wiki, especially for us genealogists, this is a good example, and the Family Search Wiki is a good example. That has 90,000 articles about doing genealogy. So it's a good place to learn information. In the case of Wikipedia, which often gets a bad rap, um, it's because anybody can add to it and they may not know what they're talking about. So. Right, yeah. Thank you. I always look at Wikipedia as a hint. It's a hint, you know, exactly. It's a place to start and you might get some good... And if you're researching something, if you find out, oh, my ancestor was in the War of 1812, you could go into Wikipedia and learn more about the War of 1812. You know, so it is a good way to get some foundational knowledge. Okay. Questions or comments? Yes. Uh, thank you because um, it took me not even a minute. I was listening to you at the same time. Sure, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I was able to get uh, the Wayback Machine. That's one thing, on, uh, and you get them from uh, like I have an iPhone, so yes. I have one of the app. The Wayback Machine is on one, and then the Internet Archives is on another. So I can have it right here. Perfect. Play with it on the way back. That's right. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm the passenger. <laughs> well, and you know, quite frankly, digitized Google websites are so important to our research. And we talked about Internet Archive, but there's also Google Books. There's also Hattie Trust, which is another wonderful site. And so it's one of those things, you know, when they say, oh, you don't need to know what you're looking for, which I hate. But in reality, that is the truth for these digitized book websites. There's another one for you, just as a bonus. <laughs> yes. Just uh, generally, I, I don't read icons well. So okay. when you're going into the digitized books, do they give you any tools to flip sideways or, or manipulate the images at all? Or is it take it as it is? And they allow you to make it bigger. Ah, uh, OK. So, and then obviously if you're able to save it, then you can do whatever you want with it. But for me, I know the biggest thing is making it bigger. Especially, I remember that microfilm I showed of the Indian census? That's, that's a nightmare. So I would want to blow it way up so I can see it. So usually digitized book websites do give you that. All right. Yeah. I'm just wondering why you wrote a book about Oh, I guess because I'm weird. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It seemed like a good thing to do. Yeah, so she said, why did you write a book about cemeteries of the Eastern Sierra? There's really no rhyme or reason. <laughs> they are being lost. They are being lost. You know, I'm a genealogist. I like cemeteries, and there's some really cool ones there. And, uh, I said to the publisher, hey, how about this? And they said, yeah. And I said, oh, okay, let's do it. <laughs> yes. Could you repeat the title of the book that you pointed out before you talked about the copy trust? That was like an intro book by genealogy. Oh, the source? It, was that it? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's here. Yeah, Beth, Beth has 
has it, and it's a must read for everybody. Actually, part of it is on Google Books, or uh, yeah, Google Books. So it's right here, The Source, A Guidebook to American Genealogy. In the source, there were several editions, and each chapter is about a different kind of research, so church records, institution records, census records, and really, you know, it used to be that was the book you read to learn more. It's big, so it's not an easy book, but it's an important one. Now, it was part of a set that, in fact, this will make you laugh if you haven't been doing genealogy a long time, but Ancestry, when you became a member, it used to give you a book. <laughs> so, you got the source. There was also hidden sources, which is about unusual sources. And there's uh, one called printed sources. So it's a three book set. Those are all excellent books that everybody should be aware of and read. And do you have all three of them, Beth? Oh. Printed sources and hidden sources? About printed sources, yeah, the source and the book. Oh, okay, so hidden sources are, is by um, uh, Laura Pfeiffer, and that starts with a P. I think it's P F E I F F E R. You can find it on Amazon. I think you can. And then uh, printed sources is by Corey Myrie, <coughs> and you can find that on Amazon and Google Books. In fact, I think it's a shame that they stopped publishing them because people really need them. Would um, the, um, the source that you've been talking about, yeah. would they have any, the most extensive knowledge of the 1890 census that was for Well, they have a chapter on the, on the census, and so there'll be information there on the 1890. Um, I don't remember, well, I guess we can look. Huh? Ooh. You ask, and there it is. So, questions asked, facts. Uh, it shows you what, what fragments are available. So that might be important. Now, what the source would be lacking is uh, when it was published, we didn't have as much as we do now online. So it's going to be lacking some of that, but it's a good book for learning more about research and certain record types. Uh, the other book I would tell you you probably want to look at is Val Greenwood's, uh, it's called Research Guide to American Genealogy. Mm -hmm. yes. Inside the book? Yes. Uh, Internet Archive highlights it, I think, in yellow. And it didn't show it on my Mac, but if you're on a PC, it has little thumbtacks, and you just click on each one, and it takes you to that page. Yeah. So usually, yeah, the digitized book websites, typically when you put in a search term uh, that's in that book, it'll highlight it for you so you can find it easier. Do you find the double uh, the DNA? Uh, there's a lot of sites on the internet you can go to DNA in different countries and people. And they talk about Jed Match. Is that is that the new wonder thing to do? So this is the thing. You don't want to ask me questions about DNA because I'm not DNA. <laughs> so. so I don't know. So you'd have to ask somebody who knows more about DNA okay. than I do. I'm sorry. I have my limitations. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's a class coming up oh. at Family History Library on the handout back here coming up on Get Match. Um, oh, July 18th. There you go. So you can go to that. Yeah. Somebody knows what they're talking about. 